I do get a little bit obsessive about my work. I work a lot. I always have a knife in my hand and a piece of wood in my hand and I'm always um, making wood chips. And does a dragon have cheeks? <laughs> Where's the eyeball go? All through school, I was always drawing, constantly. Science class, I'd be drawing. <laughs> and I think that the teachers would always think I wasn't paying attention, but it was my way of paying attention. Um, consequently, I didn't do well academically. And, um, you know, I think this happens to a lot of young people. It, it's, really, it's really hurtful um, to be, you know, made to feel that you're stupid. <laughs> By the time I got to art school, though, like things flipped. <laughs> it was like, wow, um, you know, I could do no wrong. I had been practicing for it my whole life. Um, I heard another artist with a similar background talk about having created his own language. And essentially that's, I know what I was doing by drawing, um, and it wasn't like making a picture of something. It was just moving and and learning about relationships of line, um, what what makes something seem right, you know, the relationships of things. And and drawing is probably the best way to do that. And I'm really glad I didn't major in in sculpture at art school because. Um, um, as great as my experience with art school was, um, the creativity um, was taken out of me and I was shown how I was supposed to do it. And that didn't happen to me in sculpture. Right out of art school, we started raising a family, had two kids. Obviously, I wasn't going to make any money making art. <clears throat> but I did try. <laughs> and being, being from a working class family, it's like, if I'm going to make something, I want to be able to you know, complete the circle by finding a way of making it make money for me. And a lot of it I made up as I went along, and I continue to do that. The, the work I do, it, it just seems very innocent and kind of primitive. And um, but nonetheless, I'm proud of it. Sometimes I fall into niches with my work where I feel like, and uh, not another, you know, bird in a boat uh, or something. <laughs> um, but that falls back to my working class thing. I, I know I can sell that stuff, but I also love it too. I just delight in, um, like, playing. Yeah, I play a lot and look for, uh, I look for the, the rhyme and the, um, what holds something together. And, and you can do that abstractly. I could do that all day abstractly, but in, um, you know, by throwing the elements of play and whimsy, um, it connects it to the world. I think, you know, I get people, um, get a heart felt, you know, response. It's joyful. I draw on things from early on in my life. Um, animals have always been a huge dog lover. And I'm married to a woman who, she's like the uh, quintessential crazy cat woman. <laughs> and so that's an influence. I'm easily influenced in my imagery. And um, and I and I have a strong connection to boat like motorboats like this motorboat here. Um, as a young uh, uh, adolescent, lived on Sebago Lake and I made a bunch of friends and we would go out and my friend had a motorboat, or actually most of my friends had motorboats at the time. And um, this one particular one that sticks in my head is red and white. And we used it for water skiing. And um, 
great times, wonderful, fun times. Um, and so those times that are heartfelt for me like that feed my work. And the animals um, that I kind of keep going back to, to me, they kind of represent us. It's good to watch our animals and we can learn from them. My, my cats, they teach me that at any time of the day is a good time to take a nap. They do it all day long. It's like, how do you guys do it? In my 30s and 40s, I was part of a dance group that met every Monday. And we would do five rhythm dancing. And we'd dance for like two hours. This was probably a group. It would range from 10 to 40 people. Dance is such a fabulous thing because you're making... You're, um, you're making art that you don't have to store anywhere and you don't have to sell it. You just do it. And it's so beautiful. And it opened up my creative channels, basically. It relates so strongly to sculpture for me. That, and I can, you know, made me more aware of my body, my anatomy, which is crucial, I think, for making three-dimensional stuff. And I think during that time is is when I got back into wood carving. Uh, the ideas don't seem to stop coming. You know, like it, sometimes they get me out of bed in the morning. It's like, I got this idea and I have to either get it on paper or go out and just do it. Picture like a surfer on a surfboard uh, waiting for a wave. And that's kind of like what being in the creative process is for me. You know, I'm like waiting for another wave to come. And sometimes they come fast and furious, and sometimes I'm days without a good idea. <laughs> when I'm working on a piece and, and bringing it to a certain point, no matter how much work I put into it, um, being willing to let go and, like, maybe... So at some point with this piece, I might say, well, you know, I've already carved this head, but I might need to recarve it. I might take it away and, and do the whole thing. I might want to look in the other way. Or I might, this body might be all wrong. At any given time, I have to have, allow myself to go back in and make the changes. And to, to be able to see when things feel right. And it happens with, that same thing happens with the shapes, um, and it happens in the painting process. And that's a wonderful thing about wood. Like, if I paint something that sucks, I can carve it all away. And sometimes when you're working on an object, it's not obvious which way the grain is going. So you really have to feel it. Like, if I, I'm feeling resistance here, but I turn back here, and oh yeah, that's smooth. That's the way I want to be carving. So it's, it's a communication between the wood stockings and a little bit.